Hello everyone, we are GenEng, a fourth year civil engineering team from the University of Ottawa. Our capstone project was the Prince of Wales Bridge Rehabilitation. Throughout this presentation, we will discuss some background information, our final design, environmental measures, social involvement, project management, and outstanding tasks. Our team consists of Joanne et Michel, Antoine Beribé, Arnaud Vadeboncoeur, Sophia Borges, Maxime Beaulieu, and myself, Rock Patnaud. We were fortunate to work with our industry collaborator, Mr. Wojciech Rumish, who offered great professional advice and was an excellent mentor. Also, we would like to acknowledge our professors, Dr. Ala Abdulrida and Dr. Rosalina Dimitrova for their assistance throughout our project. The Prince of Wales Bridge is a steel truss railway bridge that has been an important landmark in the capital region for the past 130 years. It spans between Ottawa and Gatineau, nearly two kilometers upstream the Ottawa River from Parliament Hill. Fun fact, the bridge is nearly one kilometer long and its midway portion crosses Lemire Island, home of the Ottawa Water Treatment Plant. Unfortunately, the last train to cross this structure was nearly 18 years ago. This is why we received the scope of work to propose a plan that would bring this bridge back to life. Our goal for this project was to provide the local residents with new transportation opportunities while considering the public needs and heritage aspects. To conduct our design, we had to reference several codes. The two main ones were the Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code and the National Building Code of Canada. Although we considered every required load combinations, we were somewhat creative by combining load cases of both codes to consider any unexpected scenarios. For example, the bridge code does not consider snow loads, so we took into account snow loading as outlined in the building code. The loads that we considered were dead loads due to self-weight, live loads due to pedestrian, maintenance vehicle and train loads, snow loads, wind loads and earthquake loading. Train loads were taken as freight train loads to act as worst case, meaning the bridge could accommodate a light rail passenger train if needed. Wind loads were conservatively taken as acting on the truss as if it was a solid surface. The logic behind this assumption is that when a train goes by, looking at the train going left to right, it fills the voids of the trusses and the wind acts on a full surface rather than on individual truss elements. It simply makes for a more conservative results. As for earthquake loading, the equivalent static method was used to analyze the south structure, whereas a dynamic analysis would be required for the north structure. More details on that will be discussed in the outstanding tasks section. We began our feasibility study with extensive brainstorming and produced more than 30 different ideas. From simple to crazy, all ideas were encouraged and they provided great stimulation for creativity. These were then refined into a conceptual design at the end of our feasibility study, which gave us a clear starting point to conduct our design. We then modeled our design in Lumion, a 3D rendering software, to provide a more realistic feel and facilitate communicating our vision. Details about the present state of the peers will be discussed in the project management section later on. For now, assuming the existing peers are in decent condition, the process to get them back in working order would be the following. Work would begin with cofferdam installation to allow dewatering of the work sites. Then, the historical stones would be removed and salvaged for reinstatement once the piers are repaired. Structurally unsound concrete could then be chipped and replaced, followed by bearing replacements. Blast rock should be placed on the riverbed around the piers to prevent scouring, and the piers are to be fixed with a steel plate nosing on the upstream side to protect against ice. Finally, since we did not know the extent of reconstruction required for the piers, we've included a pile design in our construction drawings should they be required. One of the biggest questions we asked ourselves throughout the project was, how are we going to attach the new walkways to the existing bridge? If we didn't figure that out, then the actual design of the cantilevered walkways would have been useless. So, we've explored a few options. The first one would have been to weld the new beams to the existing transoms. However, should members need to be replaced in the future, this method might have caused further complications and much more effort would be required to remove the welded elements. Therefore, this option was eliminated. Then, both beams could have been bolted together through their flanges. This might seem like an easy fix at first, but in practice, it could be extremely difficult to line up more than a dozen bolt holes on each member. 
every drill hole would have to be in the perfect location, but since it is nearly impossible to guarantee that for the field drilled holes on the transoms, we have eliminated this option to simplify installation. Finally, we came up with our own design. It consists of sandwiching both beams together through four one inch threaded rods. The rods would be bolted to steel plates at the top and bottom of both beams and there are two of these systems per transom, so every six meters. Stiffeners would also be installed on the webs of both beams parallel to the threaded rods to prevent the flanges from buckling. Our analysis determined that the maximum reaction force at these locations is below 400 kilonewtons. We've calculated that these systems have a capacity beyond 700 kilonewtons each. For those who do not know what a kilonewton represents, it is simply a unit of force which takes into account mass and the gravitational acceleration. To convert kilonewtons to kilograms, simply multiply the kilonewton value by 100. Let's use the reaction force as an example. 400 kilonewtons times 100 means each connection needs to support approximately 40,000 kilograms. Since the capacity of these connections is greater than the reactions, we've determined that the connection is adequate to support the gravitational loads. In terms of lateral loads due to pedestrian and maintenance vehicle loading on the walkways and also wind and earthquake loads, we found that installing sway braces in a zigzag pattern along the length of the bridge would bring its frequency within the required tolerance as per the Canadian Highway Bridge Code. Using these sway braces in combination with the previously explained connections would serve as a suitable way to connect the cantilevered walkways to the existing trusses. We've decided to add a cantilevered walkway on both sides of the steel trusses to allow pedestrians and cyclists to cross the Ottawa River. This would promote an active lifestyle and potentially reduce the amount of vehicles on the interprovincial roads during rush hour for people going to and returning from work in the neighboring province. Having two walkways would separate cyclists and pedestrians, thus eliminating the possibility of collisions between the two. It also has structural advantages since it eliminates torsional effects acting on the existing steel truss which would not be the case should there only be a walkway on one side. The walkways are built of steel and concrete, providing a smooth riding surface and adequate capacity. The walkways are also designed to support maintenance vehicles. This could be the sidewalk style snow plows during winter or small ATV emergency vehicles used by paramedics should an incident occur further on the bridge. Curbs are present to protect the railings from any potential collisions with the snow plow. In addition, expansion joints were detailed on the concrete walkways at every pier location. This is to consider thermal expansion requirements, and a sidewalk cover plate concept was the expansion joint of choice. Reason being, cyclists or wheelchairs might get caught in finger joints, and regular rubber seal expansion joints get plugged with debris, thus requiring further maintenance. The abutments would receive the same work as the piers, however, attention should be given to the ballast wall and wing walls in terms of rehabilitation. Safety fences could be installed on each side of the train track to prevent public injuries. In addition, lights could be installed to accommodate nighttime use. We've designed retaining walls for structural and aesthetic reasons. They would be useful to accommodate sloped terrain leading to the wooden lookout. We designed this above water lookout to provide a gathering and resting area to the public. It was designed in timber, giving a more natural feel to the environment. After all, who doesn't like the scent of cedar? In addition, we've included a pedestrian bridge on Namur Island. This crossing is fully accessible with elevators and stairs on both sides of the tracks. It is enclosed above the tracks with a small truss replica to eliminate any potential accidents. Its construction is in steel and concrete just like the cantilevered walkways. It features a second lookout, which would be an excellent observation point for fireworks during Canada Day, for example. Can you imagine walking along this bridge during a sunrise or sunset? We sure can. Wow, what a treat that would be. As with every construction project, it is important to consider the environment. Here, we are listing which environmental measures are relevant to this specific project.
First, silt fences should be installed as sediment and erosion control along the shorelines. Then, straw bales could serve as flow check dams and ditches to filter drainage water and prevent the Ottawa River from being contaminated. Also, turbidity curtains should be installed in the water during processes such as the wooden lookout construction, cofferdam installation, and pier reconstruction. This is to prevent any arising sedimentation blooms from expanding further into the waterway. Finally, a containment system should be installed around the steel trusses while sandblasting procedures are in effect. This could be done with sealed tarps for example and prevents the sand and paint residue from falling in the waterway. This is extremely important since given the age of the bridge, the paint most likely contains lead which would be toxic to fish. This project gave us the opportunity to get involved in the industry. Our group met with La Ville de Gatineau, the Moose Consortium, and the National Capital Commission. In addition, we were published in the Ottawa Construction News Magazine, submitted a letter to the Canadian Transportation Agency, and provided clips as well as renderings of our project for news releases. As for the project schedule, we've assumed that three specialized groups would work at the same time. Here's the logic behind this assumption. While one crew is working on the substructure of one bridge, another can tackle the superstructure of the second bridge. By bridges, we mean the north and south structures. This would prevent the crews from getting in each other's way and provide additional space for maneuvering. Also note that this assumption includes two piers and two trusses being repaired at the same time. Once each side is finished, the crews would switch structures and continue with their respective tasks. Once the pier and truss rehabilitation is complete, then the cantilevered walkways can be installed. Meanwhile, a third crew can work on the island, building the wooden lookout, retaining walls and pedestrian crossing, finishing up with electrical work and general landscape. The project schedule is estimated around 91 weeks, all depending on crew size and availability. For cost, our detailed cost estimate predicts roughly $50 million would be required to restore and improve the Prince of Wales Bridge. An important consideration is that the actual pier conditions are unknown. The next step should this project move forward would be to collect concrete core samples of the piers and determine what is their present state. Should the piers and their foundations need to be entirely replaced, an anticipated $20 million for that specific item should be considered. The project cost would then be $70 million. If this project moves forward in reality, it is important to list the limitations of our design. As mentioned earlier, the equivalent static method was used to calculate earthquake loads on the south structure since all criteria were met as per code to use the static method for those bridge segments. However, the north structure did not meet the requirements for the static analysis and so a dynamic analysis should be conducted on the north structure. A wind tunnel analysis could be required on the crossing structure, yet as per code that remains to the discretion of a specialized professional in that topic. Minor connections have yet to be detailed, bearings still need to be selected according to code, the cofferdam and work platform designs are outstanding, however in practice the cofferdam and work platform design is usually left to the contractor since different companies have different preferences. They would then determine how they want to execute the work and reflect that cost in their bid. Finally, the design of electrical work remains. So there you have it, the Prince of Wales Bridge 2.0, aimed to promote an active lifestyle and reconnect a vital rail link between Ottawa and Gatineau. Here is a glimpse of our construction drawings. Should this project be executed, more details should be added to the drawings. However, we can confidently say that we are very proud of what we have accomplished in such a short period of time. This bridge would truly have great use in the future. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us at the following address. We would be more than happy to answer any questions, comments, or concerns you might have. Thank you very much for taking the time to learn more about our project. Merci. Have yourselves an excellent day. Cheers.